that time of the week. Well, it's a little bit past that time of the week. My apologies. We're a few minutes late getting kicked off this evening. I was enjoying a rather sumptuous dinner, <laughs> if truth be told. Hello, everybody. This is Live Irish Mits. I'm your host, Anthony Murphy, for the next hour or hour and a half, somewhere in between those two. We will be reading about the Brehan Laws, and we'll be starting to talk about paganism. We are reading from uh, P.W. Joyce's book that is called A Social History of Ancient Ireland, Volume 1, published in 1903. We have been reading it for the last 14 episodes. This is the 15th reading, and we're not even halfway through yet, so lots of uh, episodes to come. If you're joining us, please do uh, feel free to say hello in the comments, and we'll uh, try to interact with you as much as possible. If you're new especially, please do announce yourself. We'll give you a lovely warm welcome. Uh, if you're on YouTube, please do subscribe to the channel and uh, click that little bell uh, icon. Uh, ring the notifications, uh, which inform you both when live streams begin and when new videos are uploaded. Um, anyway, uh, I am going to say hello to all the people who are saying hello in the comments uh, before we get started on tonight's reading. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter surprisingly the first commenter <laughs> not at all she says it's cool in texas today 12 celsius <laughs> it's three degrees in ireland right now even even when it is cool in texas it's still a lot colder in ireland <laughs> uh, but yeah that is cool all right isn't it is that like that's obviously a daytime temperature yeah winter is coming johnny wilson who's also in texas is in dallas doesn't mention the temperature um I don't think you're too far away from Elaine. John, you're very welcome. And uh, John watching on YouTube. John Main watching on YouTube is in San Francisco. And it's only 13. He says it's only 13. It's only the warmest temperature we've had so far. Okay, out of three. But, you know, uh, John, oh, God be the day when you used to ring me and say, Jesus, it's an awful cold gray old rainy day isn't it and i used to say no it's not being sunny over here <laughs> ah yes but then you swapped bell mullet for uh i was gonna say for uh cyprus but it was crete wasn't it and now san francisco yeah the problem with san francisco of course is the bay and the mist and the sea and all of that joe butler auntie joe says hooray i was getting concerned because i was a few minutes later oh, these things happen yeah on occasion when i've had technical issues um there's been lots of concerned posts on, especially the mythical Ireland community. People say, what's going on, please? And uh, one day, even Tom King rang to say, uh, is everything all right, Anthony? I was like, yeah, 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 just a few technical issues. Uh, we're usually here, there, or thereabouts, 8 o'clock on a Monday. If we're not there at exactly 8 o'clock, sometimes it's a little bit later. Do also keep an eye on I, where I have to postpone an episode. I do announce it, uh, generally, uh, almost always. Lily Shambles is saying, sending warm, uh, uh, on the social media, that is. Lily Shambles is sending warm love from a chilly lil. What is the sort of temperature where you are, Lily? If it's chilly, that means it's cold. Daisy Peters is joining us from Rio de Janeiro. Daisy, I can't remember the last time I said hello to you on a live stream, but it's very good to see you. A very good afternoon to you uh, in Rio, no less. Fantastic. Joe Butler. Uh, is saying now, saying hello from a cold and sunny Colorado. Shared to the Mythical Ireland community and Mythical Ireland creatives pages. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, uh, Joe. And just a reminder to anybody who is on Facebook, who's watching on the main Mythical Ireland page, uh, head over to the Mythical Ireland community and the Mythical Ireland creatives and join those groups as well, if you so wish. Desiree Riley is happy. Oh, well, yes, she is happy. But she says hello, first and foremost, uh, from herself and Amadeus. Happy to be here with y'all. After spending an amazing week with my family eating gumbo and playing in the snow. Wow, that sounds nice. Kind of. Uh, we haven't had any snow, and the longer we go without snow, as far as I'm concerned, the better. Uh, but it would be nice for a day or two to play with, a, do a bit of snowballing and build a snowman and all that stuff. Desiree, always a pleasure. I hope you had a great time last week. Sounds like you did. John Wilson says, our temperature here was below, I presume that's below zero Celsius this morning. Wow. That's in Texas. Brendan Byrne is saying hello from a cold but beautiful clear moonlit night in Glendalough. Just went for a walk to the Silver Lakes. Magical. Sounds it. Did you get any pictures, Brendan? That sounds lovely. You have to share that. You can't keep that to yourself. Rex Fortenberry is saying greetings from a cool and sunny Louisiana. I'm seeing a theme here in the weather. It's cooling down everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. 
Wait till we get uh, the Southern Hemisphere's Michael Trott and uh, Adele Perth and uh, the gang from uh, New Zealand and Australia telling us what it's like down there, mate. Uh, Anne McCallum says, hello, Anton and all the mighty two. Congratulations on winning the Tourist Award, Anthony. Wonderful honour for the team. Hope everyone's staying warm and all the American folks enjoyed their Thanksgiving weekend. Yes, indeed. Winter has definitely arrived in southwest Ontario. Windy, snowing, minus one Celsius at the moment, heading down to minus six. Happy to be indoors, ready for episode number 253. Well, absolutely. If it was snowing outside and it was minus one heading to minus six, I'd be staying put too. And a pleasure uh, to welcome you. And thank you in relation to the award. That is the Tourism Award at the Northeast uh, Business Excellence Awards on Saturday. I uh, love Drogheda and Drogheda Arts Centre uh, uh, won the award for tourism for the Drogheda Urban Art Trail, which is the series of mythological murals in Drogheda. And uh, of course, I was uh, a, a big part of that. A uh, great honour and a great night. Uh, great fun was had. <laughs> yes, I think we got there at around half past six, seven o'clock. And we finally get into a taxi, myself and her, my good lady wife, at 2 a.m. A good night was had, shall we say. Wayne Bird is in the house. Hello, everyone. Very cold in Birmingham, just waiting for the snow. Shame it's cloudy again. I was looking forward to seeing the full moon. Yeah, we have we had a nice view of the full moon rising there earlier on. Um, so it was clear here at uh, dusk. I'm not sure if it's still, because I haven't looked out if it's still the same, but I think it is. Sue Prenter. Is saying bright moonlight tonight. Yes, indeed. Winter full moon. Is this the snow moon? Speaking of some people mentioning snow. Anna L is in the house. Good evening, Anthony. All the two. Hello to Sue and Anna L. Uh, Marie, Heather Marie Leaning is also here. Hope you're all well, XX. Well, as well as can be expected, I suppose. Can't complain. There's a lot of shit going on in the world. I can't complain. Barbara Murphy is saying hello to everybody from a nice, cool 70 Fahrenheit in Tucson, Arizona. Okay, we have to convert that. And that's 21. What? What? You're calling that cool? It's 21 Celsius. Like, that's summertime temperatures. That's July summertime temperatures here in Ireland. Ah, ah, some people just don't know how well they have it. <laughs> Barbara, always a pleasure. And uh, stay cool. Daisy says it's very, very hot in Rio. In Rio de Janeiro. I'll do a Google search. Right now it's 81 Fahrenheit, which is, what's that in? Oh, yeah, let me just click the C. 27. Wow. As I always say, you and Barbara, you can cut a few degrees off and send them over to us. And they send a few up to Anne McCallum because it'll melt the snow. If she wants the snow melted, that is. I'm assuming, but uh, maybe she doesn't. Anna L says, the moon looks great here in Balbriggan. Yes, it does. It's fabulous. Don't forget, of course, that because the full moon is always opposite, opposite the sun, remember that the sun is low in winter, therefore the moon is high. The moon in winter is where the sun does be in summer. The full moon, that is. Um, so, yeah, it'll be out for the whole night. The moon will be in the sky until dawn, which is great, giving it, giving us its uh, sparse light. Uh, not so sparse light, actually. Yes, Kathy May Deo is in the house. Uh, I'm doing wonderful. I hope you are too, Kathy May. Cold here in Newcastle, Washington State today. Heavy frost. Temperature in Newcastle, WA, seven Celsius, forty-five Fahrenheit. Yeah, seven's okay. I mean, we're three right now, so you're warmer than us. But I imagine, yeah, heavy frost this morning. John Main is looking forward to the arrival of the calendars. Yes, they're all winging their way around the world, John, to different places. Fantastic. Archaeoastronomy Database is uh, giving us greetings. The days grow even. I know, right? Just when you think the low, the sun can't get any lower, it goes lower. Tom King is in the house on Gawa. And that, of course, uh, Archaeoastronomy Database is Thai. And Ty always sharing very interesting posts to our Mythical Ireland community. Uh, keep an eye out for those because he's looking for volunteers to go to various places to observe uh, sunrises and sunsets and moonrises and moonsets. Tom King says, hello there, Anthony on the Mighty Two. A clear moon looks in at the forge where a grand fire is lit. 
working away with the best of virtual company. Enjoy story time, my friends. Yes, indeed, Tom. Always a pleasure. Sure, look, where would we be? Where would we be without you? It just wouldn't be the same. Uh, Dami, Damia, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, is watching on YouTube from Oregon in the PNW. We have a huge following in the PNW. Damia, thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Don't think we've seen you here before. So hopefully everybody will give you a huge Cade Mila Falcha, as we say in Ireland, 100,000 welcomes. Our gastronomy database follows up. The moon is waxing full and getting very far to the north as we approach the major lunar standstill over the next couple of years. Watch it set Wednesday morning and rise later that evening. Yeah. So in addition to the fact that the full moon in winter. Coda's barking at me. Why are you barking at me? I'm live streaming. You want to you want to take over? I want to see the moon. Um, yes. So in addition to the fact that the moon is uh, in the summer sun position, it's actually further north than the sun would go, which means it's higher in the sky and in the sky for longer. Amanda Morgan is in the house from Queensland, Australia, where it's raining. Wow. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning to you. A very good morning. Yeah, I think it's early morning there, isn't it? Um, um, yeah. Um, you're in Tuesday morning, and we were just saying... Um, by the way, it's 6.20 a.m. there, according to Google. Yes, it's 8.20 p.m. here in Ireland. We were just saying, because a lot of the Northern Hemispheres are talking about cold temperatures. Not all of them, by the way. Apparently, if you're in Arizona, it's nice and warm. Um, but it's raining in Queensland. And... Uh, it's about 70 Fahrenheit there right now, according to Google. 21 Celsius. Wow. Amanda, you're very welcome. I'm not sure if we've seen you before. If we have, apologies. And if we haven't, you're very, very welcome. Enjoy, enjoy the live stream. Um, Peter Shields is glad to catch us live. Love the show from the Highlands of Scotland. Brilliant stuff, Peter. Fantastic watching on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe. And uh, yeah, what a pleasure um, to uh, to welcome you. And I wonder what is the weather like up there in the mountains? Is it uh, snow weather yet or is that still to come? Uh, Adrian O'Beglin is in the house. Falch you, uh, Machara. Uh, you're very, very welcome. Caitlin O. Uh, Pruncia is saying hello from Elk Grove, California. It's a gorgeous 13.8 Celsius here. Enjoy that your webcast is on during my lunchtime. <laughs> yeah, how convenient is that? Yes, indeed. And uh, Caitlin watching from California. Very good afternoon to you, Caitlin. Hope you enjoy your lunch and indeed that you enjoy the live stream heather marie in, uh, received the calendar thank you much lee plug plug hint hint yes indeed for anybody else interested in obtaining your 2024 mythical ireland calendar i will post the link in the comments so hopefully you'll see that thank you for the plug uh, heather marie uh, brilliant who else have we to say hello to i do apologize uh, wow i'm not apologizing there's a lot of comments this evening which is fantastic Love to see that. Um, and of course, we always give careful attention to each and every one of you, I hope. I hope that we don't miss any of you. In other words, Corey uh, Fo Fodor, Fodor uh, is in a chilly Pennsylvania. I'm glad to make it to another live. A health to the tour. I will raise a virtual glass in your honor, Corey. And thank you. Uh, what part of Pennsylvania, I wonder? Um, are you in Philly? Or are you over in Pittsburgh? Or are you somewhere in between? Um, in what is it in wav in wavas alt metal shoegaze moon was nice viewed from tibradden brilliant stuff well good evening to you not sure we've seen you before either love the icon by the way watching also on youtube and maybe you might tell us your real name uh, if if that's not your real name that is if that's just a handle but uh, you're very very welcome and to all the newcomers um lots of newcomers lately which is fantastic uh, you're very welcome sheila gun woohoo i'm on lots of snow here hello anthony and the two lots of snow there you go so i told you look D daisy and uh, barbara and a few others can shave a few degrees off and melt the snow for the others that's only if the others want the snow melted adina sparks coming in late a wizard is never late uh hope everyone is well cold 40 f here we had we had 40 f earlier didn't we and I, and I did the conversion oh no we didn't 4.44444 wow 
Yeah, that's cool. It's three here. But anyway, yeah. The woods near the cairn says in what in in is it in wavas in waves in waves in wavas. Ah, apologies, Fergal. Jacanton, also known as Fergal Canton. Greetings from Kilkenny, home from the Austria. Fergal, what a pleasure. I hope you're keeping well. Are you keeping busy down in the writing centre? Are, are you are you still doing loads? I hope you are. Paul Campbell is telling us that the full moon happened today at 9.16 a.m. Irish time. So we are actually a good few hours. We're almost 12 hours past full moon, but yes. Yes, indeed. Cheryl Shaw, you'll, you'll not see the side of the moon being shaved off until tomorrow. Cheryl Shaw is telling us that it's 57 in California, which is almost 14 Celsius. That's a decent, yeah, that's all right. We can tolerate that. Cheryl, not sure if we've seen you before. If we haven't, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for joining us. And if we have, do you know what? You're still very welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Anthony. No tea just yet. Cooking dinner says tea. That's okay. I, I, the reason I'm late is because we had a sumptuous dinner, actually. Really nice. Um, my my good lady wife, I prepared the food today, and it was fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, you have to eat. And there's no harm in having the live stream on in the background. Yes, says Anne McCallum. All, ha all to ha help to get rid of the snow. Most appreciated. There you go. Send a few degrees up to Ontario, please. Kathleen Gallagher is saying it's a beautiful day in New York. Sunny, dry, and 50F. What's 50F? That's about 11 or 12 Celsius, is it? 10. Oh, okay. Still, it's all right. Yeah. Hope all are well. Good form here, Kathleen. Always a pleasure to welcome you. John Inman is in Eureka, California. Good few viewers on the West Coast this evening or this afternoon. I have to take my neighbour to urgent care. She's had a fall. Not bad, but needs attention. Oh, well, come here. You take care of um, priorities, John, and we might see you later on. All the best to your neighbour. Hope they're okay. Uh, Barbara would trade me. Summer here can be 115 or hotter, so 70s are wonderful. Yeah. As much as we give out here in Ireland about the weather, we don't get extremes generally. So, you know, Amadeus said hi back to Coda and very raucously, I hope, and very continuously because because Coda was kind of going at it nice and strong there, you know. Uh, Teresa Collins is in the house. Hi, Anthony and Thua. It's a gorgeous clear night in Killarney. Six degrees and fab. Brilliant stuff, Teresa. Uh, thank you for joining us from the kingdom, the magical kingdom of Onkiri. Peter Shields, that's a... Uh, Malaysian territory, but of course, so is the Boyne Valley because that's where they landed the second time. Peter Shields saying it's three degrees in the Highlands, damp today, been below zero last few nights. Brr. Our weather forecast um, is a very good page on Facebook called Louth Weather for the county of Louth and the immediate area around it. And his forecast, his long range forecast this morning, suggests that we're going to have a week to 10 days of dry but cold weather. I don't mind the cold if it's not raining all the time. Kathy May says it was below freezing last night. Brrr. Um, I feel like I read that already. No, I didn't, because there's a burr directly above it in Peter's. That's what it is. Uh, Joe is saying, but oh, these comments are from ages ago, because uh, that's when Coda was barking. Uh, so I'm just going to try and catch up. Uh, 45 for our high today, says Kathy May. It's the effect of the moon on Coda also, says Brendan. Yes. Um, minus five in Oregon, southern Oregon this morning for Anne Scott Doherty. Cold. Paul McFeely is saying, hi all, hope you're all well. Brilliant stuff, Paul. You're very welcome to Live Irish Mits 235. No, I got that wrong. That's that's the Metonic cycle. 253 even. Uh, Paul, you're very welcome. Hope you're in good form. Irish technical thinker who's Marcus missed last week, but I'm here. Glad to be with you all. Look, yeah, you're, it's okay. We didn't put your name in a black book or anything. <laughs> no, we did really. I uh, know I'm joking. Uh, so good to see you. Vicky Wallace Sutherland is in the house. I'm late. No, you're not. We haven't started reading yet. <laughs> Hello to Vicky and, of course, to Evan and Chili. If you are watching, we are so delighted to say hello to you all the way from Ireland. 
uh, to where you are, which is, I actually forget right now. My apologies. Missing my trad session tonight to be with the Tutara. I'm looking forward to PW Joyce. Uh, I was going to say brilliant, but maybe it's not brilliant. Uh, Virgil, always a pleasure to welcome you, of course. Um, and loads of people saying hello to Evan and Chili, which is brilliant. 23 degrees this morning, says Vicky. That's not 23F, is it? That's minus five. Wow. Uh, in in, in wav, wavas, uh, it's in waves. Okay. Really love the show, but haven't joined in the chat before. Brilliant. Gary Howe. Well, Gary, what a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, and where did you say you were? Uh, to Braddon. To Braddon. Where is to Braddon? It's in the county of... Uh, and I know this. No, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm definitely not Googling it. Definitely wouldn't dream of Googling it. I would have said in Wicklow, but. Oh, it's in County Dublin. Near County Wicklow. Okay. Uh, forgive me for that, Gary, for calling you a, a Wicklow man when you're actually a Dubliner. Uh, yeah. Uh, what a pleasure to welcome you. And um, in waves, thanks for clarifying that. Irish Writers Centre. Still missing you, Anthony. Awaiting your next book. Yeah, I'm writing one. Uh, I've finished one. And the one that I've finished, I really need to get my act together and get it published. Yes, indeed, Fergal. Thank you for the kick up the backside. Josie Weatherford says, hello, everyone. Tony Tin, I am sick, but I enjoy listening to your show, Knitting Along. Oh, hope you're okay. Not too sick. And uh, that you're getting what you need in terms of heat and warm drinks and all that sort of stuff. Do you sign the calendar, says Elaine? I don't, as a rule, but I can do. I have had requests in previous years to sign them. Uh, one or two people wanted me to sign every picture, which I was happy to do. So if you need signed ones, let me just put the instruction in the order. So I'm all with the... Um, uh, no, um, Sue Prenter. No, I was not offended. Um, I saw that before. And didn't react to it at the time because I was busy doing something else and meant to go back. But I can tell you, uh, yes, um, uh, very funny. Uh, I, I I did enjoy it. Um, and I'm not easily offended. So there you go. Um, right. I'm all caught up. So we can start reading, I think. So tonight we are going to finish talking about the Brahman Laws and proceed on to the chapter that is called Paganism. It would be interesting to get, you know to get the slant on paganism, written from the perspective of an Irish scholar writing at the turn of the twentieth century. You know, uh, we'd be talking about the druids. That's a topic that gets a lot of people excited, and not just the kind of modern pagans either, just people in general. You know. Um, but but do 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 right. Well, come here. Um, yeah, you're all very welcome. Make yourselves comfortable. Okay, who's got the timer on for the first rabbit hole? You ready? Set the clocks. I'll give you a five second countdown to when I start reading, and then set your stopwatches. Okay, ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Eric or compensation fine. Homicide or bodily injury of any kind was atoned for by a fine called Eric, E-R-I-C, corresponding with the Teutonic Vergild, W-E-R-E-G-I-L-D. Am I getting the pronunciation of that right? Uh, that's like Germanic, isn't it? That's like a, a Germanic line. It's like German. If it was German and it was W-E-R-E-G-I-L-D. Would that be ver or were? But though this was the usual sense of Eric, the word was often applied to a fine for injury of any sort. For homicide, and for most injuries to person, property, or dignity, the Eric or fine consisted of two parts. First, the payment for the mere injury, which was determined by the severity of the injury and by other circumstances. Second, a sum called log enoch or enochlum, honor price which varied according to the rank of the parties the higher the rank the greater the honor price well some things never change folks do they the honor price of an ogara was three cows for a fur fufla seven and a half cows 
very important question here. Which half of the cow? For the, for the half, seven and a half. Which half? Like a side half cut from the head to the tail down the middle? Or like the front half or like the back half? And like, if you pay your fine and you have to cut one of your cows in two, what happens to the other half? Speaking of fines, I came back to my car today and somebody had written a nice little note on the windshield complimenting my driving. The note said, parking fine. <laughs> Was the cutting the cow in half a rabbit hole? Uh, the Ministry of Minstrels is uh, giving us um, what looks like it could be a guitar or a banjo, a snare drum, a cornet or a trumpet, a sea wave and a hand wave. Wow. It's a little bit like the Ministry for Funny Walks, except for the Ministry for an interesting combination of emojis. <laughs> no, I, but uh, Thank you and hello. And uh, Nolan says, hi from Cloudy. Pennsylvania. Well, I'm sorry to hear this cloudy, uh, Nolan, but you're very, very welcome. Good afternoon to you. Ola Conrad is late from Denmark. That's okay. It's night time. It's, it's a good, is it, it's 10 o'clock there? Is it a half 10 or is it half 11 at night? It's late. That's okay. You can be forgiven. Um, Fergal, is, how do you give half a cow? Rabbit hole. <laughs> like a, a gravy, half and a half. <laughs> uh, Catherine where uh, Woodruff is in a chilly and snowy Wisconsin. There you go. A couple of degrees up there, uh, Kathy, or not Kathy May. Um, um, watching from Rio de Janeiro is, oh, I'm having a total brain fart here. I know who she is. Um, yes, it'll come to me in a second. Uh, are dad jokes rabbit holes, asks Joe. Yes, I would say technically they are. Um, Lello, New England uh, Ministry of Minstrel says hello and then says cello. <laughs> I like your sense of humor. 2.45 minutes to the first rabbit hole, says Sue. It's not a record, you know. 9 30 p.m., says Ola. Yes, okay, it's an hour ahead of us. Kelly Nikiali is joining us. I, I'm in Firenz, Firenze. Where is that? They've got history here too. Where is that? And how do I pronounce it? Is that in PNW or is that somewhere else? Is that like Firenze in Italy? They do a special pizza there. <laughs> yes. Did I tell? Did I ever tell you I spoke? I, I keep saying to my family, I speak Italian. And my son said to me, well, say something in Italian then. I said, pizza. Anyway, seven and a half cows. Let me read on. A man's honor price was diminished which, of course, was a punishment if he was guilty of any misconduct. Dire, D-I-R-E, which is a term constantly used in the Brehan laws, seems to mean such, sorry, much the same as eneclon, a fine for personal injury of any kind, bodily harm, a slight on character, an insult, etc. The amount, depending on the nature of the events and on the position and the dignity of the persons. Helen Hurst Chader is also late. There you go. Good evening to you, Helen. Well, apparently Fergal says Firenze is Florence. Aha, okay, right. <laughs> yes. Ponto um, Vecchio. Is that what it's called? The bridge with the buildings on it? Is it Ponto? Ponto, 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 Ponto. Well, that's a fiat, Anthony. Ponto. Is it Ponto Vecchio? Is that? Am I right? I haven't been there. My brother was there uh, this year for a wedding during the summer. Evan said he speaks pizza too. <laughs> Hello, the pizza. <laughs> um, yes. Molto, molto bene. Yeah. You have to do the hand movement, you know. How do you stop an Italian from speaking? <laughs> Tie his hands behind his back. Tumbleweed jokes are my favorite, says Marcus.
Ponte, Ponte, not Ponto. Ponte, Ponte Vecchio, Old Bridge. I was telling a guy who's from Italy, who lives here in Drada, recently, that that's really interesting because Drada has an old bridge. The old bridge at um, uh, at Old Bridge. <laughs> the townland is called Old Bridge. Uh, we call it the Obelisk Bridge because there was an obelisk there until the IRA blew it up about 100 years ago. And um, that bridge is actually closed at the moment for repairs for 10 months. <laughs> Fiat stands for fix it again, Tony. <laughs> or for my sons used to say Fiat, fix it again tomorrow. Ponte Vecchio. Yeah. Or is it Vecchio? Is it Vecchio or Vecchio? Oh, for goodness sake, what a ridiculously monstrous rabbit hole. I haven't even read a full page. Um, Vecchio pronunciation. Is it Vecchio or Vecchio? You see, I don't really speak Italian. I speak a few words of Italian. When Vecchio, apparently. Uh, if I'm ever late, says Brendan Byrne, I will claim I fell down a rabbit hole left uncovered by Anthony. <laughs> Apologies, I will get back to it. Indeed, in some parts of the Brehan laws, dirra is made equivalent to eneclum. The law of compensation would tend to favour the rich, as they could afford to pay better than the poor. Nothing ever changes. And it was evidently with a view to remedy this that the arrangement of honour price was introduced. The consideration of honour price entered into a great number of the provisions of the Brehan Law, and this principle also existed in the early Teutonic Codes. The principles on which these awards should be made are laid down in great detail in the book of Ackle. The Eric for murder was double that for simple manslaughter. What about complex manslaughter <laughs> or homicide without intent? Quote, for fines are doubled by malice aforethought, unquote. The exact amount of the Eric was adjudged by a Brehan. The exact, sorry, <laughs> just read that. Uh, many modifying circumstances had to be taken into account. The actual injury, the rank of the parties for the honour price, the intention of the wrongdoer, the provocation, the amount of set-off claims, etc. So that the settlement called for much legal knowledge tact and technical skill on the part of the Brehan, quite as much as we expect in a lawyer of the present day. The man who killed a native free man paid the amount of his own honour price and and 21 cows or double if of malice. 42 cows like just the other to kept big herds back there. <laughs> Red rum. This is a rabbit hole says Barbara. Mm, yeah, let's be honest. Live Irish Mitts, in its entirety, from beginning to end, is a rabbit hole. Or that, suppose an Og Ara killed a free man by misadventure, he had to pay altogether 24 cows, 3 plus 21, or, or if of malice, 45 cows, 3 plus 42, to the family of the victim. This will give some idea of the general standard adopted, it being understood that the total fine was higher or lower according to the rank of the parties. Eric for homicide continued to be exacted in Ireland by the Anglo-Irish as well as by the old native Irish till the middle of the 17th century. That is, long after the Brehan Law had been legally abolished in the reign of James I. In case of homicide, the family of the victim were entitled to the Eric. If the culprit did not pay or absconded, leaving no property, his finna or family were liable. The guiding principle here, as in other parts of the Brehan Law, being that those who would be entitled to inherit the property of the offender should, next after himself, in their several proportions, be liable for the fine for homicide incurred by him. If they wished to avoid this, they were required to give up the offender of the fam... Sorry, to the... <laughs> Pardon me. I'm reading too fast now. I need to digest my food. If they wished to avoid this, they were required to give up the offender to the family of the victim, who might then, if they pleased, kill him or use him or sell him as a slave. I just want to know 
when they say use him what do they mean failing this his family had to expel him and to larger sum to free themselves from the consequences of his subsequent misconduct the expelled person had to leave the tribe he was then a sort of outlaw Josie Wales and would likely become a dare for the for in some other tribe if neither the slayer nor his friends paid the murder Eric then he might be lawfully killed by the friends of the victim in the book of Ackel there is a minute enumeration of bodily injuries whether by design or accident with the compensation for each taking into account the position of the parties and the other numerous circumstances that modified the amount. In Cormac's glossary, we are told that the Eric for bodily injury depended on the dignity of the part injured. I don't like where this is going. If it was the forehead or chin or any other part of the face, the Eric was greater than if the injured part was covered by raiment or clothes. Half the Eric for homicide was due for the loss of a leg, a hand, an eye, or an ear. But in no case was the collective Eric for such injuries to exceed the body fine, i.e. the Eric for homicide. Spencer, Davies, and other early English writers bitterly denounced the law of Eric fine for homicide as, quote, co contrary to God's law and man's, unquote. It was indeed a rude and inadequate sort of justice and favoured the rich as they could afford to pay fines better than the poor, notwithstanding their precautionary introduction of honour price. But it was, no doubt, very useful in its day and was a great advance on the barbarous law of retaliation, which was nothing more than private vengeance, as we said in last week's or the previous episode, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and all, all of that. Burr Whelan has joined us. Good evening. Hello there, Burr. As also has Monica Regley. Hello, Monica. How are things with you? The Italian for rabbit hole is Tana del Coniglio. Just saying, he he says Fergal. <laughs> mm. Yes. Tana del Coniglio. Mm. Good. Interesting that the sons of Turin had to pay an Eric for killing Lou's father in physical objects. Yes, indeed. What was it? Pig skins and all that sort of stuff. Yes. The principle of compensation for murder was, moreover, not peculiar to Ireland, a fact that these writers appear to have been ignorant of. It existed among the Anglo-Saxons as well as among the ancient Greeks, Franks and Germans. And as a German institution, it is mentioned with approval by Tacitus. So he wasn't tacit about it. Uh, uh, see what I did there? Never mind. Carry on. I don't think keep going. They didn't notice. In the laws of King Athelstan, there is laid down a detailed scale of prices to be paid in compensation for killing persons of various ranks of society. From an archbishop or duke down to a churl or farmer. And traces of the custom remained in English law till the early part of the last century. The last century, of course, being the 19th century, because this was written in the early 20th. Yes. Jacqueline Kelly Adams is here. Hello there and good afternoon to you. What a joy. What an honor. What a pleasure. Uh, and hello to you and your, ma and your mum. Modes of punishment. Homicide, whether by intent or by misadventure, was atoned for like other injuries by a money fine. That, that men who killed others were themselves often killed in revenge by the friends of the victim, as in all other countries, we know from our annals. But the idea of awarding death as a judicial punishment for homicide, even when it amounted to murder, does not seem to have ever taken hold of the public mind in Ireland. At this day, i.e. in the time of the writer of the commentary on the Shanachus Moor, no one is put to death by judicial sentence for his intentional crimes, as long as Eric Fine is obtained. Capital punishment was well known, though. Sorry, I'll read that properly. Capital punishment was known well enough, however, and practiced outside the courts of law. The above passage is immediately followed by the statement that if for any cause the crime is not atoned for by an Eric, then the criminal's life is forfeit. 
and kings claim the right to put persons to death for certain crimes. Thus we are told in the tripartite life of St. Patrick that neither gold nor silver would be accepted from him who lighted a fire before the lighting of the festival fire of Tara, but he should be put to death. And the death penalty was inflicted on anyone who at a fair meeting killed another or raised a serious quarrel. It would seem both from the ancient introduction to the Shanachus Moor and from the lives of St. Patrick that the early Christian monasteries attempted to introduce capital punishment as the result of a judicial process for murder, but without success. Various modes of putting criminals to death were in use in ancient Ireland. Sometimes the culprit was drowned by being flung into water, either tied up in a sack or with a heavy stone around his neck. That's barbaric. In this manner, the Danish tyrant Turgesius was put to death by King Malachi, AD 845, and Malachi being Malchachlan I, I believe. And the reader may be reminded of Scott's striking description in Rob Roy of the drowning of Morris in the Highland River by the chief's wife. Turgesius, didn't know that. There's, where is the place of Turgesius's death? It's in a, it is, I know it's in a lake, uh, but where is that lake? Anybody know? Without Googling it, anybody know where the the resting place of tr the al uh, alleged reputed uh, resting place or drowning place of Turgesius is located? Sometimes hanging was adopted, a mode of execution generally called Riga, Ria, R-I-A-G-A-D, but lenited with two H's on the G and the D, from Ria, Ria a gibbet which glosses patibulum in Zeus. Hanging was also called crocha, from cruch across or gallows, crocha crucifixio. But in Ireland it meant and still means hanging by the neck till dead. In O'Cleary's glossary, Ria, Ria is explained by crocha or crochu. Yeah, it's an interesting ter ter tergesius um, was in one source said to have been buried at Millmount here in Drogheda, but uh, I think that was a confusion there. Um, anyway, it was a very ancient Irish custom to burn women for adultery. Hmm. Just the women, right? takes two to commit adultery doesn't it wow that such a custom existed is rendered certain by its frequent mention in old writings perhaps the most authoritative of these is Cormac's glossary which gives the derivation of druth d-r-u-t-h a harlot from the two words dear and right and aid aod fire the idea of that being that druth was contracted from dear aid right fire uh, some of the um some of the um Derivations, not derivations. Um, what is it? Nomen nomenclature. Some of the, how do you, you know, what do you call it when you're explaining the origins of words? Can't remember that either. Daisy Peters, by the way, is the one in Rio de Janeiro whose name I couldn't think of earlier on. Um, yeah. Yes, the, the, the etymology, yes. The etymologies in Cormac's glossary are to be questioned, definitely. Yes, thank you, Heather Marie. Etymology, yes, indeed. Um, somebody else saying etiology, which I don't think is too far off the mark, in fairness. Um, uh, etymology, uh, archaeolinguistics. Um, you should know it, shouldn't you? <laughs> uh, what is etiology? I need to remind myself the cause set of causes or manner of causation of a disease or condition the investigation or attribution of the cause or reason for something often expressed in terms of historical or mythical explanation hmm, yeah possibly not too far off and Joseph was saying gloss yes not a gloss in this case no but uh, yeah uh, the glosses sort of add sometimes an explanation don't they they're, they're kind of the glosses are quite helpful in actually helping us understand they're helpful in helping. There you go, Anthony. 
Uh, as much as saying, the glossary continues, to burn her were right. When Murney of the Fair Neck married Cummel, C-U-M-A-L, but that's probably Cole, yes, father of Finn, after eloping with him, and when soon afterwards Cole was killed in the Battle of Knocha, Castle Knock, and Murney was found to be pregnant, her father, not acknowledging lawful marriage, urged his people to burn her. Her own father? For God's sake! But he dared not compass it for fear of Con the Hundred Fighter, with whom the lady had taken refuge. Yeah, go on. Con Cade Cahawk, good man yourself. You protect the women from these maniacs, including their own father. <clears throat> Somebody's saying Barbara Murphy, fair point. What was Barbara Murphy's point? And he better pick only people who had no friends. <laughs> yeah. So based on the Breton laws, a serial killer, says Brandon, would need to own a lot of cows. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Women based had no chance back then if a man decides to establish control over her. Some things just, yeah, never changed. I mean, I know things have changed, but, you know, in a way they don't. The son that was born to her was the celebrated Finn McCool. On this story, Hennessy, the editor, quotes a statement from the story of Cork McLugdach in the Book of Leinster. Quote, it was the custom at first to burn any woman who committed lust, uh, which is Irish doini bosh in violation of her compact, unquote. In the story of the Greek princess in the Book of Leinster, she says, quote, my crime of unchastity will now be found out and I shall be burned immediately, unquote. Many other such records might be instanced both from the lay literature and the lives of the saints. In nearly all the cases I have found, however, something intervened to prevent the actual burning, which would indicate that at the time the records were written, the custom was dying out. Indeed, this is also implied in one of the above quotations. Quote, it was the custom at first, unquote. Sheila has to feed seven dogs. Seven. Wow. Yeah. So we'll see you next week. <laughs> ah. Entomology, says Fergal, is the study of Anthony's words. <laughs> Uh, uh, that'll be a rabbit hole I'll tell you <laughs> you'd need some amount of dictionaries and books to find out what I mean when I speak I, not even my family can make sense of it where the death penalty was not inflicted for a crime various other modes of punishment were resorted to though never as the result of a judicial process before a Brehan for the Brehan's business was to award compensation never a penalty of any other kind blinding as a punishment was exceedingly common Blinding. Wow. We meet with records of it everywhere in the annals, so that there is no need to quote individual instances here. Whenever we find such a record, it is commonly the sequel of a battle, for it often happened that the victorious king or chief, if he captured his defeated opponent, blinded him. It was usually done by thrusting a needle into the eye. Oh my God. Sometimes blinding was an act of vengeance merely. Sometimes it was in punishment of rebellion. And not infrequently, when two opponents fought for the chiefship or kingship, the defeated leader was blinded to prevent the possibility of his election at any time. And I've been reading about that over the years in the annals, and I just find it the most horrendous thing to do to another human. For a disfigured person could not be elected as king or chief. And of course, we've discussed that on many occasions. Occasionally, a hostage was blinded when the treaty was broken by his party. The custom of, I mean, even that, it's not his bloody fault or her fault. The custom of blinding as a punishment prevailed among other nations as well uh, as among the Irish. Oh, yeah, and that suddenly makes it all the better. A very singular punishment was to send the culprit adrift on the open sea in a boat without sail or or rudder. In the commentary on the Shanachas Moor, it is stated that in case Eric was not obtained for homicide, the guilty person was put to death if the crime was intentional. But he was placed on the sea if it was unintentional. The men of Ross in north in the north of Tyrconnell uh, killed their tyrannical chief, Fiacha, whereupon Fiacha's brother, Donacha, king of Tyrconnell, punished them by putting 60 in small boats and sending them adrift on the sea, quote, that God might deal with them, unquote. 
Uh, Mock Cole or Macaldus, a powerful Ulster chief, was an abandoned reprobate, but he was converted by St. Patrick, became very repentant, and submitted himself to the saint's penance, who directed him to put off to sea in a cora of one hide, sorry, corak, of or cora, cora, corak, corak, I think is how it's usually pronounced, of one hide. After much weary drifting about, the corak was thrown on the Isle of Man, where McCool safely landed, safely landed. He preached the gospel there and converted the Manx men, so that he is to this day venerated as the patron saint with the name Mohold, M-A-U-G-H-O-L-D. The great Anglo-Norman baron, Hugh de Lacey, who founded Drogheda, by the way, for the Normans, followed the old native custom when he sent the betrayers of John de Courcy adrift in a ship, quote, with victuals and furniture, but without mariners or seamen, unquote. A position of this kind, sorry, a person of this kind cast on shore belonged to the owner of the shore until a como was paid for his release. Samantha Healy, a bit late. Come here. I'm always saying it's much better for you to be late than not to be here at all. So we're very happy to see you. So I'm looking for a, uh, an item here because there's something stuck in my tooth. Humans have such a cruel history through the centuries, says Simon. Uh, Simon, oh, too so far. Yeah, I know they don't. They do. And uh, dreadful stuff, you know. Mark Gordon is saying hello from Iowa. Hello, Mark. And uh, Samantha Healy will not feel lonely. Um Humans have such a crew because she's not the only one late. Um, <laughs> uh, Sheila's saying, ha, Anthony, uh, you must have said something funny at some point, um, which I can't remember now. Oh, that was about, I'll see you next week because you're feeding the dogs. <laughs> Monica says, I thought witches were hanged. Uh, Mitt burned it, Great Britain. How about Ireland? Apologies. <laughs> I can't answer that. Somebody will know that they burn witches in Ireland. Mavanway has also joined us. I'm a bit late too, I'm afraid. That's okay. I keep saying. Better to be late than not here at all. Liam Smith. Gomala Scale. I'm also late, late. That's okay. There's a whole flurry of latecomers arriving in. Michael Pike is the latest among them. And you're all coming in at nine o'clock, which leads me to wonder whether your clocks are out or something, you know? <laughs> just five of you just after arriving in a row. It's it's so wonderful to see you all. I would never chastise any of you or make an example of you. Do you, do you believe me? And the last section of this chapter is called Courts of Justice. A court heard for the trial of legal cases was commonly called Doyle, D-A for the L, which is the same name of our modern Irish parliament. But sometimes Oracht or Aracht, which is the name for our, our uh, sort of combined parliaments, the uh, the Doyle and the the uh, the Shannad, the Oraktus. Which were all, which was also the name of a meeting of representative people to settle local affairs. So some things never change. Courts were often held in the open air and sometimes in buildings. There was a, a gradation of courts from the lowest, something like our petty sessions, to the highest, the great national assembly, whether at Tara or elsewhere, representing all Ireland. Of course, they, well, the uh, Fesh Charo was only held once every three years at Samhain. So. You might have had to wait for justice in that case. Over each court, a member of the chieftain or privileged classes presided. The rank of the president corresponded to the rank of the court, and his legal status, duties, powers, and privileges were very strictly defined. The overking, or the high king, presided over the national fesh or assembly. If a man whose duty it was to attend a court for any function, and who was duly summoned, failed to appear, he was heavily fined. And in such a case, an ecclesiastic was fined twice as much as a layman. In each court, besides the Brehan who sat in judgment, there were one or more professional lawyers, advocates or pleaders called in Cormac's glossary, Dahlia and Dai, D-A-I, who conducted the cases for her, their clients 
and the Brehan judge had to hear the pleadings for both sides before coming to a decision. A non-professional man who conducted a case, which he might, as at the present day, if he wished to take the risk, was called a tongueless person. Whether the court was held in a building or in the open air, there was a platform of some kind on which the pleader stood while addressing the court. This appears from the explanation of Kushnit, a legal disputation in Cormac's glossary. Kushnit, derived from Kosnadala, the foot or bar or tribune on which the pleader stands, and it is at it or from it he pleads, and it is on it he stands to approach the bar or to be called to the bar. According to a preface uh, to the Aura, one of the causes for the meeting at Drumketa was, quote, to make rules as to pleaders and suitors in Erin, unquote. Hang on, I'm just going to, I need to catch up a few, a few moments with comments. They burned Petronella of Kildare in Kilkenny as a witch. There you go. Thanks for that, Fergal. Who was the cruelest, the Romans or the Celts? Yeah, but in or out, away from battle, that's the question, I suppose. Like in ordinary society, you know, off the battlefield. Martin Hodgins is also late. A wizard is never late, Martin Hodgins. He arrives exactly when he means to, precisely when he means to. Uh, Mile Bridge says, no, Ireland almost entirely bypassed the witch craze. I, I, or C. What's I, I, or C? Mile, how good of you to join us, by the way. Um, but, 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 but I would have thought that a boat or ship was far too inexpensive an item. Yeah, but I mean, a, a single hide Kurok, you know, is a fairly simple uh, boat. But yeah, if you have to make 60 of them, that's a different story. Uh, I thought, I think they were hung in Ireland, though there was a case of a woman in Tipperary burned as a suspected witch or slash fairy by her husband approximately 115 years ago. I remember that. I can't remember the name of the, that uh, famous case. I don't think witches were hounded in Ireland and Wales like they were in Scotland. Only a few cases of witches in Wales. Witchiness was generally accepted in this neck of the woods. Mohold is a place named <coughs> in, uh, Man. Castel uh, in Ard is a name of the Neolithic tomb there. Patricia Pack is also late. But my fashion is usually quite questionable. <laughs> Good evening to you, uh, Patricia. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Tuesday Thompson is saying Happy Mythology Monday. And it's a real Monday here. Uh, you're very welcome. There's a huge amount of people who have arrived in the past few minutes. I, I do suspect that was there a fallback that happened that has confused people or something? I don't know. It's just a lot of people have arrived after 9 p.m. We've been on going on for an hour. Really? Wow. Okay. Somebody's just giving me some information there. Um, um, yeah, San Marcus is reiterating the fact that wizards are never late nor early. They arrive precisely when they need to. Oh, if I recall correctly, thank you for clarifying that. Mm. That's a nice one, Imho, I-M-H-O, <laughs> in my humble opinion. There's nothing humble about your opinion. No, I'm not confused. I was just working late, says my father. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, that's a perfectly good excuse, by the way. Uh, with regard to evidence, I said I wouldn't make any comment about latecomers, and I wouldn't make them feel bad. And then I just did, didn't I? I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Sheila Gunn is back from feeding seven hounds. Wow. Could you come over here and feed mine? Late, but I can catch up later, says Artie. Hello, Artie, watching on YouTube. With regard to evidence, various rules were in force, which may be gathered from detached passages in the laws and general literature. In order to prove home a matter of fact in a court of justice, at least two witnesses were required. A usage that is mentioned more than once by Adavnan, who would have been, what, 8th, 7th uh, century? Um, wow. If a man gave evidence against his wife, his, the wife was entitled to give evidence in reply. Well, of course I would expect. But a man's daughter would not be heard against him in like circumstances. Wow. A chief could could give evidence against a dare tenant or any free man against a four, but neither the dare tenant nor the four could give rebutting evidence. And the king's evidence was good against all other people, with three exceptions. 
The period at which a young man could give legal evidence was when he was 17 years of age or when he had began to grow a beard. <laughs> uh, yes, which brings to mind the whole Monty Python want to buy a clip on beard, you know. Aren't you going to haggle? The Irish delighted in judgments delivered in the form of a sententious maxim or an apt illustration, some illustration bearing a striking resemblance to the case in question. The jurist who decided a case by the aid of such a parallel was recognized as gifted with great judicial wisdom and his judgment often passed into a proverb. Several judgments of this kind are recorded. When Cormac MacArt, the rightful heir to the throne of Ireland, was a boy, he lived at Tara in disguise. For the throne was held by the usurper Macon, so that Cormac dared not reveal his identity. There was at this time living near Tara a female brewery named Benny, B-E-N-N-A-I-D, whose sheep trespassed on the royal domain and ate up the queen's crop of Glosheen, or woad for dying. The queen institution, instituted proceedings for damages. The question came up for decision before the king, who, after hearing the evidence, decided that the sheep should be forfeit in payment for the glasheen. Not so, exclaimed the boy Cormac, who was present and who could not restrain, restrain his judicial instincts. Quote, the cropping of the sheep should be sufficient for the cropping of the glasheen. The woad, the wool for the woad, for both will grow again. This is a true, that is a true judgment, exclaimed all. And he who pronounced it is surely the son of a king. For kings were supposed to possess a kind of inspiration in giving their decisions. And so they discovered who Cormac was and in a short time placed him on the throne after deposing the usurper. Another example of this sort of judgment will be seen in the notice of the Cahoc at the beginning of chapter uh, uh, 13 infra. Uh, interestingly, wasn't this the origin of claim uh, Cluanartha the um the sloping trenches of Tara were supposed to have fallen away down the hill as a result of this bad uh, decision uh, this uh, uh, bad judgment on the on the part of Con so we're kind of at the junction of chapters here and I did say I wanted to begin the chapter on paganism let me just and I'm, that's all I'm going to do is begin it um Mm. Okay, this is a long chapter. Wow. Wow. It's uh, about 92, 93 pages. That's going to be like eight episodes or something like that. Gordon, eh? Farrell's in the house. Hello, Garden. Uh, Garden. Hello, Gordon. How is it going? Um... <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so I'll do a little bit of a start on, on um, paganism. And this is called Section 1, Druids their functions and powers. Druidism. No trustworthy information regarding the religion of the pagan Irish comes to us from outside. Whatever knowledge of it we possess is derived exclusively from the native literature. Moreover, all of this literature that has come down to us was written, mostly copied from older documents, in Christian times by chieftains, chiefly monks. No books penned in pre-Christian ages have been preserved. And that is true. Um, sorry. Getting distracted here now. Do -do -do -do. Po apologies. The Christian copyists, too, modified their originals in many ways, especially by introducing Christian allusions and no doubt by softening down many pagan features that were particularly repellent to them. And of course, we have pointed this out 
on many occasions ad nauseum that that is exactly what happened. Yet many passages and some complete tales remain thoroughly pagan in character. On this point, see the remarks in chapter 15, section 1. Hmm. What is chapter 15, section 1? I wonder, is it in the... Chapter 15, section 1, classes, lists, and numbers, historical and romantic tales. <laughs> That'll be interesting. So far as we can judge from the materials at our command, which are sufficiently abundant, though scattered and somewhat vague, the pagan Irish appear to have had no well-defined connected system of religion. There are many gods, but no supreme god like Zeus or Jupiter among the Greeks and Romans. So a, uh, a polytheism rather than a henotheism. Mm. That's not a chapter, says Barbara. That's a book. You're right. It is as a book within a book. Mavanway said, there, where would we be with all, without all those scribing monks? I know. We have a lot to be grateful to them for, even though, you know, Stephen King, a Stephen King chapter that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, right? There was little or no prayer and no settled general form of worship. There were no temples, but it appears from a passage in Cormac's glossary that there were altars of some kind erected to idols or to elemental gods, which must have been in the open air. We find mention of things offered to gods or idols. Thus, for instance, in the oldest version of the wooing of Emer, we are informed that at Brown Throgan, the beginning of autumn, which is Lunasa, the young of every kind of animal used to be, quote, assigned to the possession of the idol bell, unquote. Yeah, but that's rubbish. That bell thing has been uh, uh, discredited many times over in, in the intervening time. It, it used to be said that Bialtana came from the, the fires of Bell. It's nothing to do with Bell, as in um, Baal, B A A L, the old, um, not Phoenician, the old Sumerian or uh, Babylonian um, uh, uh, god or deity. And other such examples might be cited. But in all these cases, it appears to have been a mere nominal offer of dedication, a matter of words only. And it is doubtful if there was any sacrifice properly so called. We have a few examples where breaches of what were laid down as moral rules were punished. When King Lera broke his solemn oath, sworn by the sun and wind, which were regarded as gods, he was, as we were told, as we were told, killed by these two elements, from which we can see that there were some rules of conduct which it was dangerous to violate. But on the whole, the pagan Irish religion seems to have had very little influence in regulating moral conduct. At the same time, it must be borne in mind that all our very early books have been lost so that, in great probability, the whole of the evidence is not before us. Had we complete information, it might modify our judgment on Irish paganism. The religion of the pagan Irish is commonly designated as Druidism. And as the Druids were a numerous and important class, and as they were mixed up with most of the religion or superstitious rites and observances, it will be best to begin by giving a sketch of their position and functions, which will bring under review a large part of the religious beliefs of the pagan Irish. In the oldest Irish traditions, the Druids figure conspicuously. All the early colonists had their Druids, who are mentioned as holding high rank among kings and chiefs. Gaulish and Irish Druids. Of the Gaulish Druids, their doctrines and worship, detailed accounts have been given by Caesar and other classical writers. And these descriptions are generally supposed to apply to the Druids of Britain, a supposition, however, open to doubt. But these writers knew nothing of the Druids of Ireland and, of course, give no information regarding them. It is pretty certain indeed that the Druidic systems of Gaul, Britain and Ireland were originally one and the same. But the Gaels of Ireland and Scotland were separated and isolated for many centuries from the Celtic races of Gaul. And thus their religious system, like their language, naturally diverged. So that the Druidism of Ireland, as pictured forth in the native records, uh, differed in many respects from that of Gaul. Yet, with one exception, all those writers who have hitherto treated of Irish Druids have unhesitatingly applied to them Caesar's 
and other classical writers' descriptions of those of Gaul. O'Curry was the first, so far as I know, to describe in detail the, the Irish Druids from the native authorities. Certain speculative writers of the last two or three generations, backing up Caesar's description with baseless speculations of their own, have built up a great pagan religious system for Ireland, and with Druidic temples, Druids' altars, the worship of Baal, B-A-A-L, Baal, human sacrifices, divination from the manner in which the blood of victims flowed down the sloping altars, and such like, all quite visionary as being based on insufficient evidence, or rather, on no evidence at all. The following account of the Irish Druids is derived from the native literature, the only authentic source of information. It will be shown in the next section that, while there are many differences between the Irish and the Gaulish Druids, there are also many resemblances and correspondences, and these in some of their most important functions. That is all I'm going to read tonight. And I'm apologising for being slightly late getting back or getting on with uh, getting on initially with the episode. Michael Trott has joined us. The lack of records in pre-Christian Druids is like the modern gap in genealogy records. Yeah, quite. It's interesting how the genetics is, and we've said on many occasions, is filling in a lot of gaps that have been left and actually overthrowing some of the things that we believed about the Celts and, you know, that era, the Iron Age and all the rest. Um... I actually have a single page from a Bible done by a monk. Beautiful script and a fancy initial or two. But I do hate that someone deconstructed a book. Yeah, I wouldn't like that either. But anyway, I don't believe it. Come on, Anthony, you know you want to. <laughs> well, you just did, Fergal. <laughs> yeah, uh, very funny. <laughs> But if it is a chapter, I can't wait to see the book on Anthony's bookshelf. I've run out completely. There are little stacks of books all over the place. I wouldn't want to move that camera around. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how untidy this place is, basically. You, all you see is me in the chair and the bookshelves. You don't see all the shit on the floor. Oh, my God. The place is a mess. Thanks, Lily. Uh, be well and have a good night. Oh, Barbara, 11th century. Wow. Right out of place at a rock art conference, silent auction. So I was basically the only bidder at $11. Wow. Fantastic stuff. That's like a 900-year-old, possibly a 1,000-year-old uh, piece of paper. Daisy, thanks indeed. And sorry, I forgot your name earlier. I just couldn't make the connection. And I'm just... Yeah, the brain... <laughs> A lot going on in there, rabbit holes and everything. Adrian O'Beglin, thank you indeed. Thank you, Mile, and uh, please do come back again. That's that's of course. Where I'm... Wow, that's amazing, says Mavano. You'll have to share on the community page so we can all of. Oh yeah, that'd be lovely, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'd be great if you could do that. The only written records of human sacrifice by Druids were written by the Romans, the arch enemies of the Celts. So we can't take what they say as true. No, in much the same way as we can't take Geraldus Cambrensis you know, as a, a, a factual record of what happened in, uh, in the Middle Ages in Ireland, yeah. Um, who else am I missing? Um, I think that's it. Keep safe, everyone. Thanks, Wayne. And uh, like all the patrons at the Bronze Age level, uh, do please consider supporting Mythical Ireland by becoming a patron. The patrons uh, will be... Uh, getting uh, at the Bronze Age level, we'll be getting uh, all those uh, pages of my new book um, that I'm sharing two at a time with Bronze Age patrons and above. Slán agus bánacht Fergal, keep the writing up and keep the music up and all that stuff, all that good stuff, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Helen. You have a great week too. Good night, everyone. Yeah, and lovely night here uh, with the full moon out. So looking forward to it. Anne, good night, Anne. Thanks for joining us as always, Simon. Enjoyed your live, live this evening. Good stuff, Simon. Get out with the camera now. Get some full moon shots down at uh, Drawn Beg. That looks like it could be fan, quite fantastic. Um, I think it's time to go and howl at the moon, says Brendan. Uh, yes, indeed. Patricia, thank you indeed. And uh, I'm glad you enjoyed a great reading. Thank you, Elaine. Oh, I'm very glad to share my time with you. Uh, such an appreciative and wonderful audience around the world. And we had Australia and New Zealand in as well as Canada, the US. Uh, England, 
Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland, uh, Denmark. And I'm not sure if we had anyone else from other European countries this evening. But uh, there you go. Yeah. No full moon here. Snow and rain. Oh, dear. Teresa Collins. Slán. Goramaga. Thank you, indeed. Good night and take care. Yes, indeed. Slán, just says Jacqueline. And same to you. And thank you, Sheila. You're very welcome. Thank you, Mariana. And... Kathy May, you also, please have a great week. Samantha, great reading. And I'll watch for the bits I missed. Yes, indeed. Replay coming up right now. As I say, Ikawa Kolosov, Slonga Fol, August Togabuggy. <laughs>